I'm here today, as you would expect, with Anne Law Jackson from Sante in Jersey. Hello, Anne. Hello, lovely to see you. Um, now, we, we were talking um, about your centre, and I think we sort of referenced it a bit. But can you give us a few more details? Because you deal with sensory health. So just for people who perhaps haven't listened to the last however many episodes, just um, help us with what it is that you do as a sensory uh, occupational, no, specialist sensory occupational therapist. What is it you do? How, how can you help people? But also wh where does the, the centre fit into what it is that you do? Yeah, so as a sensory specialist, I help people, I equip others online through the, through the stuff that I have to assess the sensory needs of an individual, whether that be the child, an adult, an older person. And then once we found the seven, eight senses, we break down what's going on in each of those senses because they're foundational. It's how we come out of the womb. They're, they're the foundation blocks on which we develop. We put all our development onto um, to be coordinated, to speak well, to be emotionally regulated. And there are so many of our senses, so many ways that our senses process things that get in the way of having a fulfilled life and living well and feeling well. So we assess all of those senses. Then I treat them through sensory integration treatment, ideally. Some of it is what I do myself. Some of it is what I, I teach people the principles of that therapy because it's really powerful. Um, and then once the therapy has been done or while the neuro nervous system is changing, while we're changing the neurophysiology and their function physically, then we put management techniques in place, which is a kind of normal advice that if someone's bothered by sounds, they put ear defenders on or earplugs. Those are the management techniques. Those are sensory strategies, not sensory treatment. So that is where the center comes into it. The center is the space for that therapy to happen because there's lots of equipment in there that is very different to what you will see elsewhere. Although society is changing and we're getting more, more radical types, swings and things in, in the outdoor play areas, which is great. We don't have a lot of things like that indoors. So I, uh, yeah, and we need to challenge the body in a way that is exciting and that's motivating for people, which takes an element of risk. And that's why you want people to be able, able to oversee what goes on in that space, because it's that balance of allowing people the freedom and the free space to do things, but also allowing them that element of doing something different that they've never done before, uh, which is what is what really develops the brain and the body really, really well. Um I'm just thinking about sort of set the difference between sort of management and uh, and treatment because if you're thinking about sort of a the, the classic stereotype of you go to your doctor, your family practitioner, your GP. Okay, I've got a I've got a funny lump on my arm. It's it's a bit un uncomfortable, and they'll take a look and they'll say, well, that's a bruise because it's a right color, or oh, that could be something we need to get further investigation into, or what's going on here, and and they can start to evaluate it and then to diagnose the problem, and it might be okay. We need to cut something off the skin. We might need to give you some cream, or here's an ice pack. So that depending on what they see they're going to be giving us some form of treatment um so where does treatment come in then as opposed to management because management could be stop walking into walls and there's a wall in your house and there's a bit sticking out you keep banging into it well move it out of the way and you won't bang your arm you won't have the bruise on your arm which then yes will get worse and worse so how, how do we kind of understand and balance between management of a situation as opposed to treatment of a situation yeah. So if there was somebody that was banging into a wall, that's a really good, a, a lot of my people do do that, <laughs> literally. Um, so it would be, and as you say, so management is move the wall. That is what the regular people, they see something happening externally. Common sense tells you, let's move the wall, apart from the fact that it's expensive and all the rest of it. But the theory of it is, yeah, let's change, let's change the environment. That is what a lot of the advice is coming from a lot of the spaces and places and support groups that are out there because they are just common sense. Um, and you help people think through the implications of, of what happens if you bump into a wall. The treatment side of it is, why are they bumping into that wall in the first place? What is going on with their visual perceptual, their tactile system, their proprioceptive system, which is their muscles and joints? How aware of they are they of where their body is? And therefore, that's why they're bumping into the wall. So I work on the body. I work on those senses. I would look at visual. I would look at auditory as well to see what they're picking up, how much they're aware of where they are in space coming from what's coming in their ears, 
but in their tactile system, I'd assess that and I'd assess their use of their muscles and their joints and their ability to know where they are, especially when we close their eyes, give them some assessments of what it's like to do things with their eyes closed and just see how they function. So that way, I would do the actual sensory integration treatment to get the body working together so we don't need to move the wall. <laughs> um, often the strategy, some of the strategies are really cheap and really easy, but some of them, like moving a wall, would be really costly. So it's like, well, just give me six to 12 weeks with someone. Uh, let me work with them. Let them work on their own body. And it can be remarkable the difference that it can make in someone's function because we actually deal with and treat those those senses, help them develop the way that they ought to have developed in order to, to help us function best as young people and as adults. I guess partly because we think about moving a wall, that's builders, that's extensions, that's very expensive. But actually, do you know, it might be the cheaper option. <laughs> if you keep on banging it and falling over and breaking your leg, do you know what? Moving a wall might be cheaper. And actually, I suppose in a sense, that's where looking at a, another option rather than just banging into the wall, falling over and hurting yourself. It could be something sticking out of the wall. It could be a little, I don't know, a little bit of, um, I don't know, a bit of wood or something. It's like, well, take it off the wall. <laughs> okay. It might look a bit messy at first, but, but your arm won't be bruised all the time. And actually that would be an improvement. Yeah. We could also use other strategies. Well, let's, it, it, it does it look like is, do we not have that highlight? Do we, do we need to color it for the visual sense? So maybe we do, we would need to put like a, a red marker on the side. Um, it's like people walking into glass doors. It's just like, do we not think, do we not recognize that actually people can't see that that's a door that's really painful. Anybody who's walked into a glass door knows. So we've realized we need to put visual strips, some opaque things. And if people are still banging into walls, we need to change the color and make it really obvious that this, this is a pane of glass. Please do not walk into me. So we can use yeah, different strategies or if they walk closer to something, then there's a little pad and there's a noise that goes off to say, okay, you're coming near the bit where the wall is. We could use all those other different sensory strategies to help uh, stop someone bumping into the wall. I used to work for a uh, retail shop many years ago and we had a full height glass door it had like a metal surround it wasn't perfectly glass but we would frequently at least twice a week which to me was very frequent someone would just walk smart straight into the door bounce off it and fall on the floor now because it's not just glass it was very strong it was double glazed so they're not going to break it unless they really run at it and so we would and put a little poster smack in the sort of, you know, eye height ish big poster. And we were told off, oh, you can't do that. That's ruining the image of the shop. It looks ugly. And we would say, we kind of don't care because a slightly ugly door is better. I mean, not even than the lawsuit. It's better than someone being hurt unnecessarily. Just stick a poster on the, on the window, problem solved. It's so hard when you think aesthetically, I totally get it. Aesthetically looks gorgeous. I'm a big glass girl. I love glass all over the place, but not in a space where someone's going to walk into it. Um, I don't know why we don't compute that because it is, it's all over the place. I'm so glad you did. Well done you. <laughs> well, it was just one of those, everyone says, oh, it's, it's, it's the lawsuit. So I don't really, I'm not, if it's a lawsuit, it's not me personally anyway. I don't really care. Actually, I'm more interested in the fact that somebody's walking into a door. I mean, aside from any pride and whatever, and my pride's been hurt. They could seriously injure themselves. And what if they actually, the glass does smash? Now, it's just the ramifications and the consequences of not sticking a poster at eye level, which ruins the aesthetics of the door, but actually protects people from serious harm. And mentally, because if you've done that, all of a sudden you really doubt who you are and how you are, because you can't trust. A lot of my people can't trust their bodies. They're very cautious. They're very anxious. They're quite scared of a lot of things. Because for a good reason, they can't, they can't trust their own body. That is a real, that's a real trust issue that all of a sudden you could see clearly, you're normally functioning really well. And you've had this massive trauma. You bump into something that you're not aware of. If people are on their phones, there's a reason why they bump into a lamppost because they're on the phones. That's different. They're just being silly. <laughs> it's just being distracted and, that, and that's what happens. But when, when, when genuinely you believe that you are doing the right thing and you are walking well and you just go into this door because, because there's nothing visually to give you that feedback that actually you're not physically going to be able to walk through this, you're going to get hurt in the process. That's a real shock to, the, to your mental health. A lot of doubt, a lot of insecurity. It can take a long time for some people to get over that. Which is why we stuck a poster. And we got told off, it was taken down, we stick it back up again. Because you know what? Tough. Uh, okay, let's look at that idea because um, we were also talking about being risk averse. Um, one of the things that was struck me growing up is we have a, a venture 
playgrounds or adventure parks you know big massive theme parks and they're spread over many many acres and you you get strapped into this thing and it goes up a slope and it falls down the other side and yeah isn't it really really fun now personally no because i'm probably going to throw up because my stomach <laughs> does not like that but that to one side um it's amazing how safe we are and we are shocked when it goes wrong you know someone's hanging up in the air and all of a sudden the machine breaks and they fall out well yes your 200 foot suspended up and the thrill is you might fall out and you know what metal breaks and it doesn't matter how much care they put in it some point it's going to break to the point you're going to fall out that's going to happen and sadly tragically does but how do we i suppose being risk averse to society everywhere is getting slower i was driving through a 20 mile an hour speed limit the other day thinking this is too slow i'm not looking at anybody other than my speedo mm -hmm. and i really had to work really really hard as a professionally trained driver I'm now not looking at any pedestrians or anything because I'm just trying to keep slow enough under that 20 mile an hour speed limit, which is why I think, you know, that's not actually a wise way of going. But we sort of try and limit risk to the, to the extent, if we're not careful, that we're actually not living. And at some point we have to live. So um, this, this is the example I was going to give you. Um, and then you can come back at it from a central point of view. When I was put on blood thinners, I went to see my GP and said, I'm on blood thinners. I'm not sure what's going on. I guess you're going to tell me I need to stop exercising, stop mountain biking, which is what I was doing lots of the time because I might fall over and cut myself. And that's bad. And he said, no, I want you to get on your mountain bike and go cycling. And if you fall over and you cut yourself, have something to stick on the wound. Don't stop mountain biking just because you might fall off and bleed. It, you need to live and enjoy life in spite of the medication you're on. So with that as a very physical uh, example, how, how how can we understand that from a central point of view of trying to do stuff, perhaps we're risk adverse to because we're not confident in our senses, but we kind of need to live also. Yeah, yeah. The crux of the therapy that I do and the type of equipment that I use means that there are things that are different for people to explore so that they can't rely on their normal ways of doing things you on a bike you know you pedal round and round and that's that's how it works you start going on different ground all of a sudden you have to move slightly differently yes your wheels are slightly going round but you're more conscious of of your balance to accommodate for changes in the gravel so if, it, if it's gravel just in case there's something that might that might put you off that uncertainty, that un, ununiform sense of ground is the same way that my equipment works. I have equipment that challenges balance, that challenges the body in a way that causes the brain to what we call make adaptive responses, which is that we, it, we want the brain to be connecting with the body to stop itself from falling or to actually initiate something that somebody might think is pl pleasurable. All of that comes with an element of risk um, because it's like you have to put yourself out of your normal center of balance. You have to put yourself out of your normal psychological sense of I know what I'm doing, but it has to be that motivational push to want to have to strive to, to want to do something a little bit different that you've never done before. That's what's so powerful about changing the brain when those occasions happen. So it could be a risk mentally to do something that you've never done before and think about how you might um, take a step towards doing something. Uh, but it will always, from my perspective, it will always connect with a physical movement because the integration of what, how we think and how we move, the integration of our mind, soul, body, spirit is so key to being healthy, uh, spiritually healthy, physically healthy, sensory healthy, emotionally healthy. All of those go together to a really healthy humanity and, and a human being and a living experience. So, yeah, it, it's that balance of, of pushing it to outside of what is norm, which causes that element of risk, which could be a physical risk, but it could be a risk in, in other areas. But it is managed and it is careful, but it is still we have to allow people to experience how to do things differently. Otherwise, we will always do the same, think the same. You know, it's that's not living. Um, I mean, it, I was thinking about the, how we get on with the living part. If if I was on a drug, perhaps that would mess with my equilibrium, my ability to stand upright, and you know, where's where's down, where's up. If I was on something um, that was messing with that, maybe the GP would have said, "Well, perhaps mountain biking isn't the best option for you. Why don't you try a treadmill or an exercise bike that isn't moving, so you've got some fixed points." 
And I guess that's where we do need experts in their fields, which is what you do, which is what the GP was, who said, look, don't not cycle just because you could have a problem because you could not have a problem also. Because he said, he, he said, you're not going to be aiming for the ground, are you? No, you're not going to be trying to hurt yourself. No. Right. In that case, just get on with the mountain bike. And we were on the Salisbury Plains, which was brilliant. He says, you're getting fresh air, you're getting sun, you get exercise. It's good in so many levels. The possibility of cutting yourself which on blood thinners is a risk. Um, he said, that's not worth it. He said, just get out on your bike, keeping it. You're loving it. It's, it's enjoyable. It's good mm -hmm. for so many things. The one possible risk that could happen also might not happen. And therefore, why would you cut it out? And I guess we sense is we all have these comfort zones where we're happy, but we need to push who we are physically, mentally, um, in order to understand what we can achieve. Yeah. And what as a as a therapist, I kind of draw out that motivation rather than like pushing from behind. Um, it, the push is an interesting word. That, that's an interesting concept as to how we how we work it and what, what, what it means. And it's great in, in certain circumstances. Um, yeah. So it, it's just that gentle you know, motivation to think that, you know, drawing them out to do something that they've never done before, to balance in a way that they've never balanced before, to pull on something, to make something move, to see a cause and effect of, of pushing something, of going down a ramp on their front when maybe like on a scooter board, uh, which is like a skateboard, but the wheels go in all different directions. Um, so you, you can kind of like be on your front. It's like surfing, surfing on wheels indoors. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, so if yeah. you're paddling through the surf, you actually paddle on the ground instead. You've got wheels that will go in all directions and you can kind of like paddle around the room. That is that is a lovely thing. All of a sudden I ask them or I show them there's a ramp there that they can actually put their scooter board on and they can actually go down it on their front, making sure that yes, I don't have a glass wall at the end of it, that I have padding there, that I have other things that they will be safe when they land should they go down more fast than they expected to so they can't control it um and but just just see you know is that motivating do they want to try that they've had a, a feel of how fast it is to go on this scooter board some won't like the speed in which case we just stay on the floor and we'll just see if we can slowly bring the risk of, of bringing them a little bit faster sometimes i might pull them and just check are they happy with that and they can be whizzed around the room while they're on the scooter board and I'm the one that's, that's doing the pulling, <laughs> um, but they're happy with that. And then it's like, oh, should we try it on a ramp? So it's it's doing those little gradings so that we increase the risk bit by bit according to what we feel they are comfortable with. Because if they're too scared, say if they are on that roller coaster, I that is just going to flood their system and they are going to be completely overwhelmed and might be sick for the next two days. So that's not as a therapist where we go. If people choose to do that themselves, on you go. That's on, on your head, be it. Um, but as a therapist, we, we need to take things just step by step so that there is a it's a managed risk of, of how much we, we push or we pull or we um, encourage that motivation and draw out uh, how how far they're willing to go and how quickly they're willing to go and i guess the idea of of pushing ourselves and how fast can we go we we can increase that but if we don't try we don't know um i was very confident that any sort of adventure place would be bad for me because um i had one bad experience on this particular ride and i've never ever wanted to go on one since when I was working with um, in, a, in a, an additional needs school, I had responsibility in, in one of these places, and I had two kids who I was responsible for. One of them was in a wheelchair, wanted to go on this pirate ship, which is the one that just goes up and down and up again. And it's very simple. It moves on one little motion. I really, really want to go on this, Mr. Berry. Can we go on? Yes, I suppose, because um, it was supposed to be their day of fun. And I went on, and I did not do well. But I got through it because he was loving it because he was strapped into his wheelchair in the in the thing. And the, the, the staff were great. They just, mm. you know, they had ways of securing the wheelchair because that's good. Uh, and he had an absolute fantastic time. I didn't. But he did. And somehow it was worth it. You know, me feeling sick for a few days afterwards, which I did. Actually, it was worth it because I saw the joy in his face of just that. that I think it was the moment at which you become weightless. Yeah. And I guess, is it is it different because he's in a wheelchair? I don't know. But... It, he, he absolutely the elation was more than everybody else on there 
And that is gorgeous. That's linear vestibular. It, it's a beautiful thing for, for, for lots of people, not everybody. But yeah, it, it's uh, and, and especially when you are in a wheelchair, you don't have the same vestibular experiences. Uh, and I think it's it's really good that we are slowly moving as a society to incorporate uh, wheelchairs into vestibular activities. We're starting to get, I don't even know if we have one on the island here, but we're starting to get play parks that you can put a, a wheelchair on so they some some will get rotation. Um, if you've got an electric wheelchair, you can take yourself round and round, that, that, that's okay. But there's a little bit of up and down, I suppose, in, in certain wheelchairs, but that's the higher higher end of what you can afford. Um, but most won't have won't won't have a lot of vestibular input and it's so important for our for our development in in loads of different areas so just because somebody's confined it is confined in in that term physically they are confined with what their vestibular experiences can be because we haven't yet developed the full types of movements that uh, folks in wheelchairs should be able to get in order to, to help continue to use their vestibular system well I know we spoke in the past about uh, a difference between younger and older people. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing somewhere in the teens it changes where you might be on a on a roundabout and you're spinning around. And as a child, it's great. And as a 25 year old, now you're throwing up because your body can't cope. So we, we know that there are going to be changes. But is there a difference, you think, between men and women or boys and girls when it comes to challenging our I suppose safety put pushing those risk zones is because okay the the analogy analogy in my head is is lads the stereotype is lads love to do this stuff that's dangerous they get on a bike they go down a hill and they don't think about the more at the bottom they just want to go down the hill is there a difference in how we're made that that boys and girls or you, you know men and women do we do we view this differently that's fascinating because I know that I am not a what would what be classed as a typical because I I was the one that was encouraging the boys to do things my own children and it was just like so I never said careful um, and yet I knew that other family members who are female would say oh careful I'm like, why why are you saying no careful I don't get it and that and that wasn't I mean I was a young therapist at that point so it wasn't as if I was well <laughs> it just was who I was and I like I've always been yeah more of a more of a risk taker more of an optimist more of a faith you know just all of those things it's interesting how that all comes together as well um but yeah for boys we've got a, a natural i think there is a natural bent in in um i was going to say the male species i don't know how to describe it just just in men and boys generally but also because their systems need a lot more I think a vestibular proprioceptive input because the, the, the actual mass of masculinity, oh, that's an interesting one. <laughs> the mass of masculinity is is higher. So there is more input that is needed to develop a male body. Um, the intensity of everything is higher. Whereas I think girls, there, there's less of us. There seems there does seem to be something that there is on a typical basis that we don't need quite as much input and therefore we would also think it's easier for us to think ahead because we're already genuinely a little bit more integrated than boys growing up so we would think oh maybe that's not a good idea you need to make sure that there's something at the end of that down the bottom of the hill because actually you're going to hurt yourself and we you know we we you know all of that's there um but the boys are still in that oh this feels really good this is great sensory input you know really physical lots of vestibular input going really fast or spinning or upside down or you know that thrill seeking is is massively sensory um and it just it just helps boys feel good and who they are then you've got the whole bravado and then you've got all the other emotional social things that go on with with with, uh, with, with masculinity but there i think there is a difference there, there is a difference sensory wise and i think a lot of it is that the, the girls don't genuinely generally need as much input um as as the boys do because the, the mass of uh, of of boys is is different so that was interesting that was not the answer i thought you'd give at all that was really fascinating i i just see this thing of lads like charging down a hill um i remember doing it in the thrill now i'm tend to be probably more risk averse and when i got my lads on mountain bikes jumping off a little tiny wall joe was quite shocked that i was even doing that but it, it's sort of the thing i think well what if they fall we break the bike they hurt themselves that would be where my brain goes stay at home dad for so many years um so she was quite surprised that i had this one day when i was like great let's get a mountain bike and jump off a little wall 
okay, we we increased the danger levels as we went, but it was good fun. And actually, boys loved it. Mm -hmm. And Joe didn't fancy trying it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's just like, yeah, I wouldn't have done half the things and I still wouldn't. I'm happy for others to do it. It's just like, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> that does not bring me pleasure. Um, but yeah. I'll be there cheering you on, but you go for it. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Um, yeah, I love how we, we we never know what we're going to talk about, really. There's no scripting here. I've got some ideas and stuff. We don't even touch those. Um, and today we've covered the idea of taking risk. Is there a difference between genders? Yes, there seems to be some typical differences. And we've looked at things like how do we not be risk averse? How do we actually look at being risk averse? What can we do to our lives to make lives more interesting and, and to challenge ourselves, which is a good thing because mm. we are made and designed to do amazing things, are we not? we are oh go for it let's live life we need to come alive if you are not feeling alive if you are not living life to the full then something there's, there's something amiss and and start with the senses go for an extensory experience that you've never had before within certain boundaries um that yeah that will just make you feel alive and make you feel good it is good Right. If you want more information on Anne Lord Jackson, how you can connect with her and, and have help from her if you're struggling with your senses or maybe a loved one is, you can find out more at our website. It links to her for you, which is pure247radio.org, pure247radio.org forward slash A-L-J for Anne Lord Jackson. Brilliant. Thanks. Thank Anne. you, Anne. We'll see you again next time. Bye.